All right, uh, welcome everyone to uh, uh, the second session uh, that covers the um, training and it's called uh, develop and uh, more precisely we're going to cover data management, sync and security. In the previous lesson, Adam walked you through how you design your model to account for the security requirements of your app. In this session, we'll go in a bit more detail and actually uh, do some live coding and uh, show you some demos including stuff like peer-to-peer. -peer. I saw, a f I heard a few of you were asking those questions in the previous uh, lesson so, section, talk, sorry. Before we uh, go into it, a quick uh, reminder about our Couchbase Connect 16 application. Uh, we'd really appreciate if you could uh, spare some time to uh, maybe take the survey that's in there and um, give us your feedback on the presentations and the conference. So today um, is Jim uh, presenting. Hi, I'm Jim, and I'm the lead developer on CouchbaseLite.net. And I'm James, I'm technical writer at Couchbase, and I focus on mobile documentation. So today, the agenda is gonna be four main sections. First of all, Couchbase Lite, where you will primarily start developing your applications on a local only sort of uh, local only connectivity, so you're only persisting data here. And then once you add synchronization, you start thinking about conflict resolution because it's a distributed database. And and then also supported platforms. You may want to implement your application in a different platform. So we'll talk about what we cover and then where you might want to in which direction you might want to go. Once we've got that, um, so Jim, Jim will be presenting the Couchbase Lite section, and then I'll take over for Sync Gateway. I'll present some of the Sync function um, implementation that Adam showed this morning, and then test it out with the app. And then after that, we'll do a quick integration overview of how you can plug into the REST Sync Gateway API uh, using some uh, HTTP client, make some changes to the Sync Gateway and see them updated on the app. And finally, Jim will present you peer-to-peer -peer and show you a cool demo of uh, the same app, but in a peer-to-peer -peer context. Cool, so I'll leave it to you, Jim. Thank you, James. How's everybody doing today? Fine, I hope. All right, so let's start at the beginning, at the database. So we're gonna, we have a number of platforms that we support. We have native solutions for Java, Objective-C, Swift, and C-sharp, as well as hybrid, PhoneGap, others, and uh, native JS, JavaScript applications, NativeScript, React Native. So a plethora of options that you can choose from. And let's start with uh, creating a database. Let's start with defining a database. <clears throat> what is a database? If you come from the relational database world, you might be used to tables and rows and columns, but in Couchbase Lite and NoSQL, a database is simply a collection of documents, a collection of JSON files you can imagine them as. Um, Couchbase Lite is embedded serverless architecture, much akin to SQLite. All the logic is embedded within the application, and there's no calls to server and stuff like that. So you have a kind of group of JSON documents, and that is your data. So we have a nice slide here to kind of walk you into it. First, we have this line here. Database equals a manager. A manager in Couchbase Lite is basically a controller for a group of databases. And it's the entry point into Couchbase Lite. It will give you the databases that you want in the directory that you specify. So in this one, we're just gonna use the default shared one and use this database named method. So this will get an existing database or create it if it does not exist. So this one will never return null for you. If it doesn't exist, it will create it. There's another one that won't create it, but this one will. So now you have a database, congratulations. Now we are going to actually put a document into it. So let's see what we're gonna do about that. Whoa, that document. 
database.createDocument. Well, that was pretty simple. Now you have a document, and you can put properties into it to your heart's desire. Um, in this case, we're going to uh, you know, kind of restrain ourselves from putting in a gigantic file, and we're just going to put in this. Task, apples. <laughs> there you go. I guess uh, we like apples, so we're going to put apples into the database. And we can set up the UI to grab this document out and display it in the UI just like this. And that part is not shown, but you know, this is just for a visualization to go along with the code. So now that we've gotten this document named apples, we decided that actually we don't actually like all apples. We just like red apples because green apples don't taste good. So <laughs> we're going to edit this task now, and we're going to name it red apples. So this is a concept that, some, that takes a bit of getting used to in the fact that documents in the database are immutable. And what you're actually doing when you update a document is creating a new revision on the document. So you'll have a history of all your edits. And the easiest way to do this is through the update method here. This update will take care of creating the revision for you, passing it into your callback. You can set it to red apples because red apples are the best. And then return true if you want to save that change or return false if you want to not save that change. We're going to return true to save the change. And when you call this, it will take care of making sure that no one's changed it before you got there and trying to reconcile and get the latest change to be this one. And now, but uh, we decided we don't like apples at all. So we're just going to delete it. How do you delete a document? That's very easy. Just call document.delete. And you can see maybe you hooked up this call into the button you see on the screen. So you delete the document, and it's gone, as you would expect. So that's, that's nice. But sometimes you have a large data set. You don't want to be pulling that down every time your user opens the app or installs it for the first time. And we have a customer, uh, Ryanair, who's doing this exact thing. And it saved them a lot of traffic. They were sending 80 gigabytes per day to all their users in their app. And they were able to kind of use the pre-built database model to cut that down to 10 gigabytes. So what is this pre-built database? Well, you can bundle in a database with your app when you install it and use that as kind of your base data for data that you know, really doesn't change that much or changes very infrequently. You call it semi-static data. And you can bundle that in, and that saves them from downloading it at the beginning when they install the app. And it saves a lot of time, too. So in this case, let's see what we've done. Don't worry about. This part here, this is just specific to the training. It basically just says we're not going to use this feature if this feature is turned off. So in, now you see here database exists named. Uh, this will get a database that already exists and return null if it does not exist. So this will not create it, it since that's not what we want to do in this case. We want to check if it's already there and not overwrite it every time. So if it's null, that means it does not exist. And so let's get it. In here, we've got bundle.main.path. This is pretty iOS specific, but you would do this in different ways on different platforms. Basically, get the information and call replace database named. That will set your to do database to be the one that was bundled with your application. And then you have all these beautiful groceries over here. Yeah, there, I think there's even apples on there. Yep, there they are. <laughs> All right, so I hope you, you followed so far. We've created a database, and we've put some documents into it. But this isn't enough to be entirely useful. Document IDs have to be unique. And so if you are defining the document IDs, well, I guess you could go in and grab them one by one. But what we really should be doing is this, creating an index. and. Is this text big enough for people, everyone to read? Just wondering, because I can zoom in. Uh, but we want to, since this data doesn't have a structure enforced at the database level, that responsibility gets pushed up to the app level. So it's all just data, and it's up to your app to interpret it as it likes. So let's say we have this data over here, and look at these IDs. They're pretty, they're pretty just meaningless. So. How, would, how do we know how to get these? Well, we would define this map function here. 
this map function will get called every time you put in, every time you update the index for the view. And it'll take all of the views it hasn't indexed yet and put them through here. This doc parameter is the properties of your document, and this emit is the key to it all. This emit lets you define what comes in to the index. So what are we going to do? Let me turn on the pen here. So first we check here that the type is task list. We're going to ignore everything except for task list for this. So let's go over here. Oh, look, the first one just happens to be a task list. And so we should enter. And what do we do? We emit the name. Oh, well, there's the name. It's groceries. Come over here, and you see that groceries has an entry. You might be a little bit confused as to why this is the second entry when we entered it first, but when you get an index, it's guaranteed to be ordered by key. So you'll see later, we have this name apps here and today here. So those will go in, and this will be sorted when you retrieve it. So apps, groceries, to the alphabetical order. And if you have a UI, then this might be an example of what you see. Task list, you have apps, groceries, and today. All right. That was the hardest part. This part conceptually might be a little bit more difficult, but let's see if we can wrap our heads around it. Data aggregation. So after you've created this beautiful index, maybe you want to get some kind of statistics about it. Yeah, a reduce function is what is for that, what that is for. Reduce function will take all of your data, map it, and well, reduce it, I guess. Reduce it into one metric. So a statistic. One of the, some of the common ones are count, sum, you know, average, you know, stuff like that. A lot of numeric operations, but it can also be non-numeric operations. Let's see what we've done here. All right, this time we have a different map function. Okay, so we're going to start with this. This time we're looking at tasks. So we go into this one. Oh, this one. Nope, that's not a task. Let's just skip it. So, oh, we found a task here. What are we going to do? We're going to emit the ID. Oh, the ID is ID of the task, the task list ID, task list ID B. You see here, we have an entry for B. And this goes on and on for this one, this one, this one, and this one. All right, and next, let's uh, ignore this for one minute and see what would happen if we just called it on this. We would get keys, 0, 0, B, B, Z, A, and value null, 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 null. Well, that's OK. It's OK for them to be null. We're just looking at how long the values array that gets passed in here is. The value is null because we emitted null here. Sometimes you don't really care about the value. Sometimes you do. It's up to your <coughs> app logic. But in this case, we have a simple example that we just want the, the number of entries. And so the value is not particularly relevant for our example. And we get a length of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so that would emit five as our value, and we'd have the count. Now we're going to introduce a concept called group level. Here we put group level equals one. This will group everything by the first element of the key. That's a, that's a bit of a hard statement to understand, but because, I mean, this is just one element. But if we had an array, we would have potentially multiple elements. In this case, we only have one element, so group level equals one is the only one that makes sense. So what would happen when we pass in group level equals one is that each of these keys that are identical would be placed into a group, and each, each of those groups would then be reduced. So you see here, two zero keys. They get placed into the blue group. Well, blue in the slide. You have two Bs. They get grouped here and a ZA, that gets its own group. And each of these would go into the reduce function. And out would come the values. 
2 for 0, 2 for b, and 1 for za, because that's how many there are. Values would be 2, 2, and 1. And what we're doing, by the way, is counting the number of incomplete tasks in these lists so we can display them here in the UI. Cool, huh? So if we drill down into this, we would have two unchecked tasks inside. OK. Now I am going to talk about sync. Because everything we've done up to this point has been local. This has all been with the local database, you know, aggregating our data and kind of picking at it and getting the stuff that we want. But now we want to share it with the world, our amazing, beautiful set of data. So we're going to start a replication. And wow, there's a lot of code here. But let me just first say that this is the probably the most extreme case that you could get. Really, all you need to start replication is a line like this and a line like that. So you create local data, you write two lines, and you've got sync working. That's cool, huh? Let's see. What else are we doing in here, though? These properties help shape how the replication is going to behave. So we have two directions for replication. We have a push. <coughs> and we have a pull. Push will take data from your local database and place it into the remote endpoint, be it where it may, another device, the sync gateway, where have you. Or you could have a pull. Pull will take data from the remote, place it into your local. So the other way. You might think it's a little bit silly to split these into two, but there are reasons for this. Think about a P2P application. If you have device A pushing to device B, and you have device B pushing to device A, where's the need for the pull? They will both get each other's documents just by pushing them to each other. So two directions, two, also two modes, one shot or non-continuous and continuous. You specify that by continuous equals true, we'll set it to be continuous. And what that means is that it'll make its very best effort to keep going in the face of extreme danger. And that's not to say that it will succeed every time. There are a few cases where it cannot recover and it will simply stop. For example, you put in the wrong URL and the endpoint doesn't exist. I mean, it's not really productive to keep trying after that. But for the most part, it's going to try to keep going in the face of network changes and low connectivity and whatever, as opposed to the non-continuous, which will get its initial set of changes, go through those changes, and then stop. And that's useful for when you only want to update at certain times. And it's also very helpful for saving the battery life on the device. And so what else are we doing here? This line might be scary looking. It's very iOS specific. It's signing up for notifications when the replication is changed. The replication will talk to you and say, hey, I've got new changes I'm going to process. Hey, I finished processing those new changes. Or I've stopped, help me. Or I've gone offline. Or a lot of different things. I have it in an exception. Here's what it was. So for C Sharp, you would just subscribe to the event and for Java, you would add a new change observer object onto it. And this section here deals with authentication. So there's a various ones built in, basic, Facebook, persona, and we now have OpenID auth as of 1.3. And you can set up your own using the cookies property, you know, going to your own authorization server, getting the authorization token back and sending that. As That's beyond the scope of this talk. But in this case, we're just using basic auth. So the username and the password gets encoded in the headers and sent off. Setting it at both push and pull. 
so that we know who wants the data. And that's useful for the sync function that some of you might have had a nice talk about during the last presentation. So now some of you, as astutely, let's hold questions until the end. Some of the astute people might realize that when you have this situation, you might have a case where there's two devices who go offline, and then they both make the change to the same document, and then they both come back online. So what happens? Well, this is going to happen. The cap theorem demands it. And well, this is called a conflict. You're going to have two revisions based off of the same parent. That's called a conflict. And it's up to your application to determine what it wants to do with them. Some of the common strategies in include, if someone deletes it, it needs to be gone. Or anyway merge, which I will show in the next slide. Or last update wins, which is basically just pick one. And that's the winner. So here's Nway merge. We have a document, name is text, and complete is false. Well, suddenly we have two people that have changed it. Now it's text changed and completed equals true. Well, we are fortunate enough that they've changed different properties. So we'll just take the properties, the changed ones off of these two, make a new revision, and delete all the others. And that will be our new winner. But this logic is going to be very specific to your use case. So the library can't really define one size fits all. And with that, I'm going to switch over to James, and he's going to talk to you a bit about what's going to happen after you've pushed up the documents from local to remote. Thank you, Jim. Uh, that was very insightful. And thanks for building the application. Now. You've told me that all users have access to all the data if we don't have any security implemented on the server side. And this is not what we want. We'd like users to have access to their own data only. So that's what the sync function does. And let's have a very quick recap at the functionality as, a, as an overview and then jump into the actual um, sync function. So you have three documents and three channels. And in your data model, you decide that doc1 is channel 1 and 2, doc2 is in channel 2, doc3 is in channel 3. First, what we'll do is we'll write the rule to route them to channels in the sync function. And then we'll grant users access to those channels. That's step two. Also, we'll see that user two will be granted the role two, the green one. And by virtue of having role two, we'll have access to the documents in channel three. So then, once it's all calculated, your device, your other device, which is logged in as the same user, will get the correct documents, not all of them. So <clears throat> here I've got the application. It's synchronizing to a Sync Gateway instance running on my machine. And I'm going to start this instance. And here you see that the default sync function is just channels. So what I need to do is then to write some access rules. The first thing you can do is actually log some of the properties. And then you can just click Deploy to Server. You don't have to restart Sync Gateway. I can then insert a document 
with a type property, which is going to be task list. I then see in the SYN gateway logs here the document type task list message that I wrote here. Document type, doc type comes from here. So then the message is this one. And then you can start defining the different blocks depending on your document type. The first one is actually write permission. And that's to say that I can only create a list for myself. The API in the sync function that allows to do that is the require function, which takes a string. So here you see that the request is sent as user1 in pass. It's the same user that we're going to log in as on the app. But there's no point in logging in, logging out. We're just going to do it from the command line for now. And once we're ready, we'll log into the app. So this require user is checking that the string in here matches with the user that's passed in as the authenticated user in the context of the sync function. That's why I need to have it on my data model as well. And then I can say doc.owner. Then I deploy. And let's just see if I put user2 instead of user1, let's see what happens. I get a wrong user message. That means I'm not allowed to perform this operation and the document is not persisted. So I'll put back user one and this time it succeeds. Next, I want to add the routing. That's when I want to like, assign a document to a channel. You can call, uh, it's, it takes a string as well. And one of the requirements of the application is that every list in the app has its own channel. So what do we have in the data model so far that's kind of unique to every list? Well, not much. But it will create this ID for us when we create the document. So we can use this. And then click to deploy. And this time I don't have to change anything. I can reload the UI and see that now the document here is previewed. It has the owner, the task list, the rev, and the ID, which were both generated by Sync Gateway. And in the output, in the results, I see that it's been mapped to this channel. That's not very readable, so I will add a prefix to say that this is a channel that's for lists because you could have many channels for different entities and it's hard just by reading the channel name what it's holding inside. Now, I could, I could deploy here and add another document, reload, see that now the list is called list dot and log in. But if I log in, the list won't be showing here because I don't have access to it. I'm only calling channel. I'm not calling access. So user one doesn't have access to this channel. That's why I'm going to add the access call here. And it takes two parameters that are both strings. The first one is the username, which I get from my data from my document and the second one is the channel name which I'm just going to copy over here. There's one last thing we need to do on the UI here of the app we're showing a title. I happen to know that the property for this is, is called name but obviously, in your, in your case, you, you would have a document that holds the schema that everybody needs to agree to on the client and the server. So I'm going to call this connect 16. Now I deploy and I persist it. 
I log in again as user one, and this time the list shows in the UI. So those three steps, write permission. Usually you have validation that comes here, but we didn't do it now. You, those four steps apply to all your different document types, or they could apply to, you, know, you could decide whatever you like uh, to do in terms of the patterns in your sync function. And briefly, I would like also to talk about integration. That's when you have other systems that need to export or import documents into your, um, into your Couchbase mobile databases, Sync Gateway or Couchbase Lite. That's why you can use the REST APIs available on Sync Gateway to perform those. You can perform operations such as subscription to events or batch importing and exporting. There are different ways to do this. You could build your own client library, or you could use, uh, we're currently experimenting with um, Swagger, which is a way to declaratively write your, your documentation and then generate a, an HTTP client automatically based on the spec. And that's what it does here. So the spec.js file is a really long JSON file that we maintain and that we use to document our REST API. And then Swagger has a library which is called Swagger Client, which takes in the spec, a few options, and then, out, and then generates the client on the fly. So here I'm running the script, node app. And what's neat about this is that you can use the help method to print out what's available on the client. It shows different tags, operations for documents, such as get db document, get uh, put a document, create a document. That's why then I can say I want to have an endpoint to get this document here. That's what I would do. So I would call dot help on document. And then when I run my script again, it shows me only the document operations. Let's say that I wanted to get some information on that get DB method. I would call help on that one. And then I would get the list of parameters that I have to provide, such as the document ID, the database name, attachments optionally, and more. That's what we're doing here. We're passing the database name and then a document ID. And once we've got this, we're going to update the name to be Connect 2016. Remember, we wrote it in originally as Connect 16. So that's going to update the name to Connect 2016. And then it's going to persist it back to Couch to Sync Gateway. Excuse me. And hopefully, Couchbase Lite will pull this and update the UI. The document ID here is hard-coded, but you could have a view that queries the documents and more, in a more um, logical way than just by ID. OK, so now you see in the response that there's this ID and rev. Here, sorry. To say that it was successfully persisted. And now in the app, yeah, it's, it's there. I could change it to 2017. Oops, not 2017. Oh, I should not have done that. I'll, yeah. And it got updated straight away. It's amazing how relevant we are in the future. Yeah. So. That's how you can, on the server side, implement security, integrate with other systems. And now I'll hand it back over to Jim to show you the peer-to-peer -peer features. Oh, thank you very much for that. I actually learned a lot. I'm not even kidding. But. 
also peer-to-peer. -peer. Sometimes you're in an environment where you can't connect to a server at all. You know, it's the middle of Antarctica or something. But connect, you can connect and exchange data directly via P2P replication. And you can mix and match with these different topologies. For example, this one, which is just sort of going around and around and around, syncing to one another on the network as they find other peers available. Finding other peers available is a bit of a difficult thing to do. And beyond the scope of this talk, you could uh, try Bonjour, IP multicasting, QR codes, what have you. There's a plethora of options to go through that. But this applies to after you've discovered the other the other's IP address. And you could say have the one here on the left be connected to a sync gateway at some point so that when you get all the information from your peers, you go over to the over to the office and sync up all the changes to sync gateway. And the application code doesn't change. What changes is simply adding the listener module into Couchbase Lite and pointing another Couchbase Lite add it. So just changing a few lines of the replication code and then you'll have P2P. So let's kind of go over the demo that I prepared for today. So in the beginning there was an Android app and he was lonely. He had nobody to talk to out here in the middle of nowhere. And then suddenly, oh, there's a network. And on this network, oh no, a Windows app. <laughs> oh well. They're both very lonely here on this network, so they decide to put aside their differences and start talking to each other. Very nice, right? Then all of a sudden, a big booming voice comes out of the sky. It's the cloud. And in the cloud, there's Sync Gateway, and Sync Gateway is bringing with it its Couchbase server behind it. And so the Android app is a bit of an atheist, so he says, no way, I'm not, I'm not touching this. The Windows app is like, sure, OK, I'll do it. <laughs> and so he is going to push up the, or she is going to push up the data to Sync Gateway once the internet connection becomes available. I forgot to mention that up until this point, these two were disjointed and there was no internet connection. All right, let's try to get out of that without changing the slide. I have a demo prepared on a different machine because I like to make things difficult. There is no internet connection. Yes, I'm announcing. See? I'll even show you. There is no internet connection here. Here on Visor, I have a device. Android device. Wow, well, it's going to be really loud too. So, let's see what happens if we add stuff on here. Oh, look at that. It's like magic, just boom, right over. Because these two, Android is talking to Windows via P2P. Notice it could not possibly be talking to Sync Gateway because we have no internet connection as indicated by this brilliant icon down here and this message. So, hmm, I wonder what happens if we, uh, this is the uh, address of our cloud here. Don't worry about it, it's not gonna be there for very long. But let's try connecting to Connect16. By the way, if you need the code, there it is.
Let's watch it fail. All right, I don't feel like waiting for it to go into its retry loop for the whole 60 seconds, so I'm just going to cheat and restart it. Ah, it takes such a long time to get here, doesn't it? Well, to appease the demo gods, I'll just try one more time. Let's see what it's doing. Yeah. All right, I can only assume that there's some issue between either the user and the keyboard or the cloud and the app. So rather than sit here and try to, you know, appease the demo gods, I think it'd be better use of the time to move on with the, the slides because we have about five minutes remaining and I want to have time for questions. Anyway, this is the, uh, some of the last slides. I'd just like to uh, remind you that we have this uh, Peer Insights available, and I would really appreciate if you could take 15 minutes of your time and create a profile on this web page and provide some uh, feedback about the product in general. This is very useful for us when de determining like, what direction to bring the product in and what features pe people really want. And, you know, stuff like that, and it would be very helpful for us as developers and as, you know, engineers. So with that, we might even be able to scan that QR code right off of the projector. <laughs> but uh, with that, yeah. Be sure to check out the next in the uh, series, testing and deploying Crouchbase Mobile here today at 4 p.m. All right. Thank you very much. Think. Yeah. Here. Yeah. When it's thinking that we got to we had to uh, get the microphone because uh, oh. the live stream. Oh, oh okay. hello. Um, I was just wondering, when do we create an index? When we load the app, like, what is the most efficient? Where, uh, when? Well, the when index we... will get created automatically every time you run a query on the data. Oh, OK. So when you query the data, it will, you can set it to either update before you get the results, update after you get the results, or just simply not update at all. So when you are syncing the database to the mobile side, consider the limitation of memory on the mobile device, 
how you limit the size that sync over to the mobile if you have a large database on the server end. So that's um, my microphone. Is not Can you switch over? Um, that's all done on in the sync function. In the sync function, it sort of if you think about the database on. Should I use your mic? Just. Sorry. So if you think about the server side, you've got your Couchbase state club bucket, which could contain a lot, a lot of document. And your sync function sort of filters what a user gets into the local database on the device by using access and channel. Right? So on the server, you have all of your data. And then what you've defined in the sync function is what then decides that a user user one, user two, you know, all your users will get, so that makes sense. And furthermore, on the local side, there is an operation called purge that you can take advantage of. This will delete the document from your local device only and not sync that change up to the uh, cloud data set so that maybe old documents that you don't care about anymore, you can purge them and they'll be gone. So uh, when it's syncing up, uh, is there a way to sync all the revisions, or is it just the latest revision when we sync the documents to the local code space like? Well, it depends on which uh, push or pull, and the number of comp It's only going to push up the current revisions for uh, the sake of space and relevance. That's the only guaranteed think that you'll have all of the uh, current leaf revisions. When I say leaf revision, that means any conflicts are also going to come down with it. And the revision history itself will come down, as in if you have 10 revisions of a document, you'll get the, I, the revision IDs for 10 down to, down to one or down to the maximum limit of the number of revisions in the history. And so if you really need that data, you can get it through the REST API by specifying that revision as one of the query parameters. Okay. But by default, you get just the latest. latest. Thank you. How do you manage? So obviously, in the sync gateway, you can manage roles for um, and channels for access. So, you know, in the previous one, they were showing, you know, that you might have a manager role, for example, in a task list. And so, let's say I'm I'm running this task list app on my phone and I have a manager role, so I have full access. How do, then does the access get related to peer-to-peer? -peer? Let's say I happen to be on a plane and I lose all connection and now I'm trying to do peer-to-peer -peer syncing with other people who have that app on the plane, but now my permissions are significantly higher. Does that mean that possibly my higher permission documents get synced to their phones or how do I, how do I manage that? There's a different uh, place that this validation is going to take place for peer-to-peer. -peer. Since there's no sync function in play at all, we have uh, what we call validation functions on the database, which will define at the replication level or at the database level which document is acceptable for insertion into the database. OK, so I have to totally re-implement that validation in the native language of that device. So I have to have now have it in two places and maintain it separately. Yes. OK. I would, I would say add to that that um, you could also have um, filters. So you, d you don't have perhaps to do it on the whole security model that you have implemented on, on the server side. You could have um, <coughs> filters on your replication that, yes, decide if a document gets replicated, but it certainly wouldn't be as big as your sync function. Because if you think of moderators, they only they sync everything apart from a certain amount of documents. And you could have your doc.owner. If you know yourself that you're a moderator, then every document which you have created or you have access to, <coughs> sorry, will just, just be disregarded by, by the syncing. All right, we've, we've gotten the uh, signal to wrap up. And so if anybody has any more questions, you can come, come to us directly. We'll be at the conference, obviously, and at the party tonight. 
which you should all attend because there's an amazing raffle. And, you know, we don't bite. Don't worry. <laughs>